doing other things, then that knowledge is not disappearing, but is if we don't leave it, gets weak. And if it gets weak, at some point will disappear. Take for example the language. If you don't speak your language, you will lose it eventually. But there are many more things that are part of a way of life. So that's why I had a hard time with the elders trying to convince them to to write something. And that's what they told me. We already gave everything to you. Well, not to me personally, but you know, to to us as people. But anyway, uh, one of my elders, we call her Abuela Juana Pacheco. She was recently up here uh, helping us with a ceremony f to celebrate some Pantli, the Day of the Dead. So she wrote this for us for this gathering. Ever since 1492, the Europeans stole our fruits, cut off our branches, burned our trunk, but could not kill our roots. We're still here as strong as ever. We have come here today to pursue it, to honor our ancestors and all generation before us that struggled throughout their lives to keep alive our roots that offer their blood to nourish this sacred ground we walk on. We are here today in Patushet to show the people of this country and the people of the four directions that despite that we are not in mainstream media or prime time, we still are here as strong as ever. We are here today in Patusha to tell this country that it is good to have a black brother in the White House, but also to remind you that the struggle our struggle is not over yet. We are here today to tell you that we will continue our struggle until this country stops ignoring us in all public debates. We will continue our struggle until no one is considered an illegal immigrant. We will continue our struggle and to re-stop racism, sexism, homophobia, war. We will continue our struggle until the government, this government, and the governments of this continent accepts that we, native people, are sovereign nations. We will continue our struggle until we give our brother Leonard Peltier justice and freedom. This is the sky of the eagle, the condor, the quetzal. This is the sacred land of Pajasapa, Black Hills, Chaco Canyon, Tenochtitlan, Ashlan, Petenitsa, Abdiala, Machu Picchu, Amazons. This is the homeland of Masasoy, Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Tecumseh, Geronimo, Chief Joseph, Anakanoa, Cuauhtemo, Tecumuman, Ruminahu, Pachachute, Tupac Amaru. We have come here today to Patushe to remind the people of this country and the people of the four directions that we, the native peoples, we are the spirit of this land. Today, here in Patachut, we look around and see many friends, many colors. We thank you for sharing this struggle. We are strong 
We are here as strong as ever. Native peoples are alive. The struggle goes on. Never again a world without us. Tiawi. Tiawi. Everyone placed their hope and trust with a couple named Bill and Hillary Clinton. But we were betrayed at the last minute. I know that many of my friends, family, and supporters were crushed. I began to feel the weight and pressure of a lifetime of being unjustly imprisoned. This began to crowd me into a corner of my cell and then in my mind. But it was this thing that has been our battle cry for so many years. In the spirit of Crazy Horse, I remembered what he stood for and remained a warrior until his last breath. It is a strength that we stand upon when we are right. We were right to be in Oglala, and we were right to be prepared to defend ourselves. What wasn't right is that a jury never got to hear any of this testimony. And the rest of the trial was a product of the fabrication and then manipulation of the FBI. This spirit of Crazy Horse is a spirit of total resistance to the wrongs perpetrated towards your people, community, family, and yourself. Some of us called it outrage, but that is just merely an emotion without resolving the issue. It is when we make a conscious choice to try and balance the wrongs in this society that we are being compelled by this spirit of resistance to stand in defense of the wronged. That spirit cannot be conquered, and I refused to submit and give in when it appeared that there would be no hope. It was because of the letters of support and encouragement from so many people that I continued on for another eight years. And now people seem to feel there is change blowing in the wind and that the election of Obama is a manifestation of that change. Oh. I sincerely hope so, because I am now 64 years old and coming up on my 33rd year of being confined and fighting for justice and my freedom. Obama may be my last chance at securing my freedom. If there is one thing I learned from earlier campaigns on my clemency is that he won't just be able to do it by himself. He is going to need your support in the form of public opinion on the case. That isn't going to happen until we can create education and awareness on the circumstances of my case across this country and send letters. My case has to be a national issue on justice denied. Those are the words of Leonard Felger. In the mid-70s, there was a peaceful encampment on the Pine Ridge Reservation that was attacked by the FBI. Leonard and some members of AIM defended themselves. Two FBI agents were killed. The first trial, there were two trials. Leonard's was the second trial. Mr. Peltier's was the second. In the first trial, they were allowed to present self-defense as a defense and the defendants were acquitted when leonard came to trial he was not allowed to use that defense and he was convicted and he was sentenced to two consecutive life terms he has been in the federal penitentiary or the federal prison system as he said for over 33 years he did not receive justice and every year on this hill, since that has happened, we have called for his release. But as he said, we, or he can't do it himself. He needs our support. He needs letters being sent to the president, to the president-elect, and all of that kind of stuff. That's the only way that we're gonna get Leonard out of jail, is if we raise our voices and demand that he be set free. I would like to now introduce uh, Bert Waters, who is going to read a statement from, from Mr. Peltier. And after that, we are going to have the blanket dance.
And what we do there is where we raise funds to help Leonard Peltier in his struggle for freedom. There will be some people coming amongst you with a blanket, shawl, and please uh, dig deep. I know economic times are tough, but Leonard does not only need our moral support, but he also needs our financial support. So, Bert, if you're ready. Thank you very much. Greetings to my relatives, friends, and supporters. As the National Day of Mourning commemorates its 39th anniversary, I find myself approaching my 33rd year, and I can't but help to see the striking similarities between why you are there and I am here in this prison. And it is the denial of the truth by people who can make a difference. And it doesn't help matters. It doesn't help matters any that those who know do nothing but enable the myth of thanksgiving. But we must continue to change that. I hope that this will be the last statement I will have to write to you from prison on this national day of mourning. I tell you this because I want to believe that I can stand here with you next year, a free man. It would be an honor for me to stand in your circle to mourn the people who have fallen in the path of colonialization. I carry many names and memories of friends and relatives who have passed on in defending the people. Many people whom I want to remember their sacrifice for me. Those names begin with Joe Stunts and hopefully have ended with Standing Deer. In between, I want to remember Rocky Duanas, Dallas Thundershield, Bobby Garcia, and Standing Deer. Having many of my, friend, my family and friends who have passed on and I could not be there weighs on me because they have suffered also through the years of my living nightmare. We've been through a lot, but we are still here, and we are the evidence of the Western Hemisphere being populated before the first real immigrant arrived on our shores, and they have a holiday for him. And all we have is a day of recognition today. So let's use the Native American Heritage Day as another page in writing the truth of our history. My sister, Betty Ann, and others will be carrying the truth in Fargo, where I was railroaded by the manipulations of the FBI. It is another day they will pay attention to us. This is how we will keep the faith and remain strong. So I offer my most humble gratitude to you for being here today and every year. And I ask everyone to work with my committee as we prepare for a push to bring me home. Right now, the two most important things I would like for everyone to concentrate on is the 30-year mandatory patrol bar, and my transfer. I am going to be made, I am going to be transferred from Lewisburg in Pennsylvania, and we are requesting that the transfer be made to a facility that is closer to my family. There are plans being made, and they will be released when it is time. You can subscribe to our list at the 
website to stay updated on what we are doing and what we can do to help. I look forward to seeing you here next year. In the spirit of Crazy Horse, Leonard Cartier. Mother Earth beneath, and Father Sky above you. Leonard, keep up the spirit of the Red Road. Strength and peace, love and happiness. Light will shine on through all your life. Sacrifice you made for your people, bear fruit. The Great Spirit, bless your life. With a heart of love, balance, and patience. Leonard Peltier, free, free at last. Itakuye Oyasi. Blessed by Wakantanka. Pueblo, a long way from here, and uh, I'm glad to be here. This is my second year in a row. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to tell you about a journey I took, but first I think in celebration, um, I have a few words about uh, our election. Um, the election is now over. We have our president, a long journey which began with the refusal of one woman to give up her seat on a bus. Yeah. that inspired a cry of outrage in Selma, Alabama, which led us to the siege on a church in Wounded Knee, South Dakota, the takeover of, takeover of Alcatraz and the BIA headquarters in Washington, D.C., Martin Luther King's march on Washington, this road, which started with whispered voices in the dark, rose to a roar of dissent in the last year and has finally given us a new face for America. But the work is not over, the celebrations are over, the party headquarters are dark and quiet. Though the giddiness and hopefulness may remain, the work is just beginning. Because now is the time to show Barack Obama what we want. I saw his speech at Pro Agency where he promised to revitalize and revamp the Indian Health Service. We need it, and we need it now. But we also need for President-elect Obama and all other elected leaders in Washington to understand that their religious freedom for Native Americans means that we don't have to tell you what we're doing. <laughs> Our religion is not for public consumption. It is ours alone and our religious freedom means that we don't tell you why we want eagle feathers. And we don't have to ask permission when we need them for our ceremonies. Obama has not been given a mandate. He's been given an opportunity to show this world what our country can be if we make it so. And he has a difficult legacy to overcome this nation, created on land stolen from Native Americans and built on the back of African slaves, has a lot to overcome. 
And most of us, for most of us, this has not been the land of the free. This has been the land of the free market. And you see how well that's turned out in the last year. <laughs> for the last eight years, most of us have struggled, disenfranchised, marginalized, and dispirited. We lost faith in our government, hope for the future, lost our will to fight. But still, it is not the time to rest and trust in Washington to lead us. We took to the streets to elect this president, and we have to stay on the streets to make sure that he follows the right path. Now is the time for us to accept the responsibility, not only for ourselves, for this planet and all living creatures on it, because we have started destroying their world. We now have to take it back and give it back to them. Now is the time to lay down the mantle of victory and start working for the future. President Obama is not the end of the road. He represents the first steps to a much larger journey. Many of us have hoped that Obama will finally be the one to deviate from this pro-Israeli narrative that has so long led this country into war in the Middle East and has compromised so much of the current administration's efforts for peace in the Middle East. So I want to tell you a story now. And this story is about a journey I took last spring. To begin the story, I will tell you about the land I come from. My people have lived on that land always, far beyond any history's records far beyond any living memory, deep into the time of legend. You cannot tell the story of my people without talking about the land. They are one single story. And this past spring, I went to Palestine 48, and I stood in East Jerusalem and took part in a panel discussion with Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs and Palestinians and international peace activists and we all despaired about the lack of any real concrete movement towards peace in Palestine and Israel. We were all on the same page and we talked at great length about how a just peace could be achieved and what concessions each side were willing to make, final status issues. And I said, if we're all on the same page, then why isn't there peace in the Middle East? If we can sit here and agree on all of these things, why isn't there peace in the Middle East? Because $5 billion a year out of the military industrial complex goes to Israel to feed a brutal occupation. And one of the women said to me, you can't really understand what it's like to be Jewish you can't really understand what it's like unless you are the survivor of a holocaust or the grandchild of a holocaust survivor and she started talking about how many people died in the holocaust and i said i understand the legacy of transgenerational trauma is not yours alone in 1491 the Americas were populated by 100 million people, one-fifth of the world's population. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, there were 10 million people in the Americas. Genocide is genocide. Cultural genocide is still genocide. So last spring, I went on a journey I traveled to Palestine 48 and found the indigenous inhabitants of a once vast and beautiful land had been invaded, colonized, brutalized, and occupied. These same people who had once roamed this vast and beautiful land were now confined to small parcels of land within the great territory they once roamed. It was a land that was occupied by a military regime whose thirst for resources and power had reduced their populations by tenfold. And the remaining ones within their own communities. It was a place 
where women and children were routinely slaughtered, where men were detained, imprisoned, in squalid cells without hope for freedom, without due process. Does any of this sound familiar? A place where traditional villages were destroyed and people were removed to refugee, refugee camps, reservations, removed without compensation, without reason, without hope for the future. But in this place of sorrow, I found a people rich in culture, music, language, arts, where hospitality is offered freely and graciously without hesitation, a cup of tea, a bowl of olives, a cake, even in homes where people struggle to feed their children. I found a people with quiet dignity who refused to give up their hopes, their dreams, their pride, who laughed easily and often, even at the most difficult places in their lives. I found a people who epitomize the ideal. To exist is to resist. I traveled 10,000 miles from home and found myself in the same place. I come from there and I have memories. Born as mortals are, I have a mother and a house with many windows. I have brothers, friends, and a prison cell with a cold window. Mine is the wave snatched by seagulls. I have my own view and an extra blade of grass. Mine is the moon at the far edge of words and the bounty of birds and the immortal olive tree. I walked this land before the swords turned its living body into a laden table. I come from there. I render the sky unto her mother when the sky weeps for her mother. And I weep to make myself known to a returning cloud. I learned all the words worthy of the court of blood so that I could break the rule I learned all the words and broke them up to make a single word, homeland. Shalom Akshav, peace. <laughs>